<laughs> Is that a yes? <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> All right, that's some horse trading. <laughs> To remind you that the note well, uh, please, this, this is what uh, governs the way we uh, work here in terms of your rights, privileges, responsibilities. Um, please make sure you are aware of this before you contribute. <laughs> also a brief reminder of living the code of conduct in bottom line is please treat each other with respect at all times. We have a very long agenda, <laughs> which is uh, <clears throat> hopefully the first part will go very, very rapidly. And then uh, it'll slow down as we get deeper into the agenda. Um, we have two sessions. We'll go as far as we can today and then we will move to uh, uh, get the, whatever we don't get to today, we'll go to the, the second session. There's a bunch of pages to this. <laughs> um, are there any agenda bashes? <laughs> Hey, wouldn't it be cool to talk about the uh, non strap for the CSR to provide fresh freshness for it? Absolutely. Okay, that is a, uh, at this point, I believe it's an individual draft. Is that right? Yeah. We have not yet adopted it. So yep. we'll deal with that in uh, section six. Fantastic. Thank you. Any other agenda bashes? Okay then uh, this is the part where many of the uh, presentations do not need slides, but the first one up did provide slides. So let me go find them. Hello, it's John. Can you hear me? Welcome. Boy, are you screaming. Please. Oh, am I screaming? Sorry. I, I, I don't usually talk that loud. So anyway, OK, if you can hear me, great. Um, greetings from Canada. It's 1.30 a.m. here. So I just have one slide to present. It'll be very quick on the CHEM, re chem recipient info update. I guess when the slide comes up, you can go to the next slide. But yeah, so this is work with Russ and Tomofumi as well. I'm sure you all know and love this draft. Um, so this draft, uh, very quickly, there was a bit of um, a bounce going on. So at the last since the last ITF, um, it was temporarily bounced back into the working group because there was a bunch of discussions on whether the cipher text uh, should be included as an input to the KDF. Anyway, so a bunch of discussions, long story short, ultimately no changes were made to the document other than we highlighted at the introduction of the document um, the uh, required security properties of the chem algorithm, and that was already had already been in the security section at the back of the doc. The security considerations already contain that. Um, so anyway, that basically so bounce back. And right now, the doc is currently in the RFC editor's, editor's queue. So yay. Um, so I don't know if there's any questions about that, but uh, that's it. Any questions? I don't know what that means. <laughs> I'm not seeing any, John, and I don't see anybody in the queue. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Okay, the uh, next draft is the NFEKU. It is also in the RFC editor's queue. As a matter of fact, it's in Auth48. <laughs> so that's like the absolute last stages before it becomes an RFC. Um, is there anything the authors need to give us an update about? Okay, seeing none, uh, no one jumping into the queue. 
The next one is um, PKCS12 using PVMAC1. Uh, Hubert, uh, I believe this is also in the RFC editor's queue. Is there anything you need to share with us? Okay, cool. Um, the next one is the X509 uh, policy graph which uh, is David Benjamin's document. And I think it actually is an RFC now. But no, it's still in the RFC editor's queue. Yep. Okay. Any, is David even in the room? <laughs> nope. Okay, I saw it just, I spoke to him in the hall a few yeah. minutes ago. <laughs> All right. Fair enough with that. And uh, the next one is header protection. So this one has been having a lot of discussions in ITF uh, last call. DKG, did you, <laughs> did you send slides on this? You did. Okay. Yep, they're there. Okay. Ah, there it is. Okay. I'm going to talk about both uh, the header protection and and then email security guidance uh, document um, okay. in one well, they're, side they're deck. Both, they're both there, right? Yep. It's one side deck, covers them both. Pretty short. So the header protection document has had some substantive changes since last meeting. Uh, we got a lot of good feedback in the uh, from uh, last call and uh, IESG review. Um, this is a list of some specific changes. There's nothing really radical here. We didn't actually change specifically what's happening, but what we did, we, there is a registry for the header confidentiality policies uh, requested from IANA. Um, we've clarified something about, you know, what the header confidentiality policy can produce. Again, it's not an actual concrete change, but it is uh, a, a clarification there. We're no longer nudging IANA about the content type parameters registry because that doesn't exist and we don't want to create one here. Um, and we expanded some security considerations and tightened up the musts and the shoulds for conformant mail user agents. So the idea is if you're going to conform to this, let's be a little bit clearer about what you should do uh, or what you must do. Um, and if you're not going to conform with it, well, then you're not bothering with those musts or shoulds. It now formally updates 8551 because the wrapped message section actually makes a little bit of a tweak to the, um, the older style of header protection that no one seems to have actually implemented or deployed. Um, but just wanted to add a pointer from 8551 to this. Um, and we did some cleanup of the pseudocode just to get the variable names more consistent across it. It is still in a misref state waiting on end end email guidance. Uh, next slide. Um, so one thing that has happened since we are, when I ended the review, they passed it on to the designated expert, uh, and they came back with a question about how the, um, if you'll recall, the draft introduces two new fields that are HP removed, that is header protection removed and HP obscured, um, that are used so that we have a cryptographic, um, indication on the interior of the message about what was done to tweak the outside of the message so that we don't leave recipient mail user agents uh, struggling to infer the properties of header fields that had been obscured or removed based on the confidentiality policy. Um, we don't leave them dealing with the external data, which isn't actually cryptographically protected. Um, the question that came up was, given that these two header fields are going to contain header names, do we need to say anything different about them because the header names are case insensitive, but header field values can be case sensitive. And I think the answer is we don't really need to say that much, but we may do one more rev of this draft with just a little additional note that says when the header confidentiality policy itself is comparing header names, it does so case insensitively. Um, but I think that's all we're gonna need to do. If anybody has any thoughts about the case insensitivity of header name, header field names, uh, and wants to recommend more text, now is the time to do it. 
I suspect this last little revision is not going to be a big deal, uh, but that's where we're, we're, what we're looking at for that. Um, I can move on to the end-to-end -end mail guidance draft unless anybody wants to pop up and ask a question about header protection. So um, this is Russ. Um, Alexi has a whole lot of experience with this, I think, and he's a co-author. Yep. <laughs> so that's yes, probably he is. Ah, he's walking to the mic. <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah, I did reply. I think it's fine to actually, uh, other than the clarification that they are compared case insensitively, uh, there is no need for them to be in any particular case in the uh, HP obscured or HP removed itself. Uh, there are no specific cryptographic properties we need or anything like that. So it just needs to be included. And whenever you search for it, you'll need to canonicalize what you're looking up and what you're, you know, comparing with. So that's just normal, usual stuff for email, basically. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So the N10 mail guidance draft has also gotten quite a bit of really, uh, thoughtful and uh, interesting feedback during IESG review and last call. Um, I'll, I'll hit, tackle the right-hand side of this slide first. Um, we have added three more sections to future work that came up in the discussions. Uh, we are not trying to answer these questions in this draft, but we are pointing out that webmail needs to be considered as a special case, that mailing lists may present additional challenges, and that the human readable names in email uh, headers in particular uh, are really not tackled by any of the current proposals about how to do end-to-end -end mail uh, cryptographic protections uh, safely. Um, so those are highlighted. Again, this draft has a big appendix. That's this future work appendix. And we're just trying to make a little catalog here of the things that nobody's bothered to write down how to do properly. Um, and we've added to that. Um, I see Roman in the queue. Do you want to wait till I finish the slide, Roman, or do you want to jump in? Okay. Please finish. Uh, yep, I heard it. Thanks. Um, so the changes to the non-appendix part of the draft, um, we clarify that there are different kinds of mail user agents that we might be thinking about: the conformant mail user agents, the legacy conformant, the legacy mail user agents, which are ones that don't know about header protection but can handle uh, encryption and decryption, um, and then there's the non-cryptographic mail user agents that are going to be um, pretty difficult to work with, but we want to make sure that our messages comply are, are useful for those as well. That's been kind of the, um, uh, sorry, not just for header protection, but for all of this in general. So we're clarifying those categories. Again, we've tightened up the musts for conformant mail user agents, similar to what we did for header protection. Um, and then uh, we are, uh, the, uh, the other substantive changes are that we have explicitly recommended that you encrypt your drafts. Uh, because if you don't encrypt your drafts, you're leaking the content of the message to the mail server where your drafts are stored. Um, we've uh, added a section about how to deal with weak encryption. So we had a section for how to deal with signatures that don't validate, including signatures that are too weak. We've added a section about how to deal with messages that are encrypted with um, algorithms that we currently know to be weak or suspect, um, which basically divides that process into... Um, uh, whether you think you're looking at an archival message or a new message coming in, it was a little bit of guidance there. Um, and we've clarified that really we expect there to be three set states for sending mail. You can send it normal, send it signed, or send it signed and encrypted. But we acknowledge that when you're uh, receiving messages, there might be a fourth state, which is an encrypted message with an invalid signature. Um, and just try to clarify that's a little bit weird, but that's sort of a property of how the email ecosystem is working right now. Uh, and we just have to sort of deal with it. Um, next slide. So one question, the, the ISG review has now been cleared for this draft. Um, we believe it's ready for the RFC editor. One question that did come up during the review was whether this document should be considered for uh, best current practice status instead of just informational. And at the moment, I believe we are leaning towards just going ahead with informational, trying to move it to best current uh, practice would probably require another round of IESG review. Um, and we would prefer to just like get this document out. There's enough, you know, future, future work section that 
uh, if people are interested and actively engaged, we could probably do a this on this at some point. And maybe that's the point when we consider a DCP uh, uh, approach. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, next slide I think is the last slide. Yeah, and so just wanna highlight for folks in the room here, the probably biggest questions for you if you know, one is what we just talked about for the header protection about the question about case sensitivity on the header names. It didn't sound like anybody had any, any questions. And then um, if you really think that the E2E mail guidance draft should be DCP instead of informational, now's a good time to speak up because otherwise we're going to go ahead and do it informational. And I hope folks will start thinking about trying to uh, address some of the future work section because we've outlined uh, quite a number of challenges that exist. Um, so I think that's it. Roman. Uh, hi, Roman. Uh, Roman Dineta, Responsible ID. Uh, it's, I came up to Mike to ask that exact question about informational or BCP. If I don't hear otherwise that we want BCP, uh, when, when we move on to the next slide, I'm going to just send it to the RFC editor. So now is really the time to mention it. And then lastly, I want to say there's been a tremendous amount of back and forth on this document. Thank you to the editor team for for incorporating all those comments and we're explaining to all the all the other reviewers why why this is some of the some of the discussion points that they brought up have already been discussed and adjudicated in the working group yes indeed thank you for being so responsive ron ron gondwana i i wanted to comment on the bcp versus informational um, bcp is best common practice i don't think this is in common practice yet hopefully one day it will be but you can't really publish that before it's been tested as a common practice. So I think informational is the right thing at this stage and then come back with a common practice later. Does anyone have a different view? If not, if so, come to the thing now. Okay, Ron. I thought BCP was, was a best current practice, not best common practice, but I'm not actually arguing with Ron and about the outcome. So. <laughs> Okay, so um, the next two uh, went forward in a surprising order. RFC 8399-BIS is now an RFC. It's 9549. And the other one, the with a slightly smaller number before, uh, 8398-BIS is still waiting in the RFC editor's queue. <laughs> so that's where we stand on those. Um, so the next one is the PKIX, uh, the next category are the PKIX related documents. And we had uh, CERT binding for multi-auth in working group last call. And that passed working group last call and has then now been submitted to the uh, ISG. They haven't done anything with it as yet, as far as I can tell. So I'd be surprised if there's an update, but if there is, Please come to the microphone. Uh, okay, Mike. Uh, Mike Jenkins, NSA. Um, yeah, we're, uh, we have uh, comments on it um, and we're addressing them. Uh, okay, so the AD review happened. Yes, uh, Roman gave it. I, I missed that. We're actually in last call. Ah. Okay, thank you. Um, RFC 5019 BIS, that's the update to the uh, OCSP for high volume environments. Go ahead, Sean. It's in working group last call, right? I, I think Ooh. that um, just the other day I said the draft was updated. Is there anybody who thinks there, they have an issue that was not resolved? And we're just waiting a few days to see if anyone says there is one. Okay. The next one is uh, the no revocation available. And Tim put that in last call uh, maybe three weeks ago or something. Um, we're waiting for a consensus call. I, I believe that a update was posted to resolve the last issues. We're waiting to hear whether everyone agrees with that. Okay, 
4210 bis hendrick i think you sent slides so good evening to australia can you so next slide off? please yeah can you back your volume off a smidge you are booming in here <laughs> I don't see a place for us to do it. Okay. It's just too loud. The remote people are really loud and I don't see a place for us to turn it down. Okay, I, I will try to speak not that loud. I don't know how to tweak my my mic okay. mm, 67 12 bis is like it was the last uh, month all changes are incorporated and um, we are waiting for 40 10 bis to catch up next slide please So there were quite a lot of changes to 4010 bis. So mainly we did incorporate now all the changes from CMP update RFC 9480. We did update uh, the POP mechanisms to support CAM keys. We did um, prepare a section on CAM based message protection which is in line um, and using the approach from CMS camera. Um, we did also add some clarifying text on how to use um, password based Mac with non H Mac um, in case um, key expansion is needed. And yeah, so the authors feel like we did now follow up on all the actions we had from the ADs and from the working group. There are some um, feedbacks um, on the issue tracker in GitHub. Um, we got from, from Thomas Gustafsson on um, other uh, parts of the document, which I will briefly um, introduce on the next slides and ask the working group for guidance how to, to proceed here. We would still like to get feedback on uh, the CAM section as it is now um, completed and CMS camera as kind of our role model is um, approved. So I think this is a good, good chance, good point in time to, to look at the CAM based message protection sections. Good. Um, as Hannes already mentioned, there is this um, draft on um, providing a freshness nonsense for um, attestation in case this uh, would be um, adopted by the working group. We could, of course, also incorporate uh, the syntax for the CMP messages in 4210 bis. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is um, the slide I also presented the last um, meetings on the CAM based message protection. I just wanted to briefly highlight um, where we did changes um, here in bold. We added um, a CAM context um, octet string as an optional field um, to kind of have offer the same flexibility as in CMS camera with a UKM with a UKM field. So more details on how to, how to use it is in the um, document, but maybe this um, CAM other info already um, incorporates uh, some mandatory or two mandatory fields. So a base, um, a static string, as well as the transaction ID. And using these two, we, has a com we have a contact separation but um, we learned that there are some, um, or there may be some um, CAM algorithms that need further um, context. And therefore we also added this uh, CAM context field 
as part of the CAM PB parameter, so the algorithm identifier, as well as the other info, which is then um, part of the KDF. Good. Next slide, please. So now coming to the open issues on GitHub, uh, the first uh, feedback from uh, Thomas was on uh, section 422. Uh, section 422 um, describes a, a mandatory scheme for CMP um, uh, certificate management. And um, in the meantime, we have different profiles. We have the appendixes C and D. In this document, we have RFC 9483, but we also have the LTE and the UNISIC um, profile. So therefore, um, Thomas felt like it is not current anymore to to specify a, a mandatory to implement scheme in in this place and therefore he's um, yeah asking for removing normative language here um, we did talk a bit about this topic and felt like we could either do the minimum change here and just um, um, rename the section and and or remove the normative text. But when looking more into the document, uh, we figure out that section three, four, and six all contain a lot of normative language at uh, various places, which are not, not really needed if you um, see that there are profiles that do specify these things in much more detail. So this is option three, um, which could um, also mean changing these three sections and kind of modernizing the text and uh, removing um, at least lots of the normative text there. Um, the question is now, um, as this was not yet a part of the the tasks um, the authors or the editors got from the working group how to proceed here are the editors <laughs> recommending option three pardon i are you are you the group of editors recommending option three <sighs> i think that is a no <laughs> <laughs> It it is it is a matter of um, how how far we want to go. So I I could do this change. I could provide a pull request on GitHub um, doing these changes. Um, the, the the point is, um, yeah, is this uh, yeah it it would mean to modernize the, the document uh, quite a bit. And this may be meaningful as it is kind of in some sections outdated. Uh, Mike, are you in queue to address this? Okay. Does anyone want to offer uh, Hendrik any uh, choice among these advice regarding the, these three choices? All right, sure, Russ. Mike Ellsworth. So, Hendrik, the slide doesn't really clearly state what the problem is the problem has to do with whether and entities can communicate directly with the ca and it for the way the wording if i understand correctly from issue 43 the the issue is that the current wording sort of implies direct connections and not ra brokered connections which of course people do ra brokered connections all the time so the common practice is not compatible with the current wording right that's the core it that is a point, but it also kind of overrules um, the stipulations in the different profiles, as this is a, at a central part of the document, giving some requirements like to use this implicit, um, non-implicit confirm, so to use a second round trip. And in some of the profiles, um, the second round trip is omitted. And uh, therefore, how to say it as we do have 
profiles, it feels like it is not um, good to have such a, a meta profile um, in in this part of the the basic uh, document. So the the proposal is more to to leave um, the mandatory to implement messages uh, to the profiles and not stated at at this point of the text. The way I read 4210, it's saying you can support any profile you want, but you must support the second one. Mm -hmm. I think right. it would be uh, a significant change to not have to support the second one. We'd have to get working group consensus to make that kind of change. anyone advocating that kind of a change not hearing anyone i think they want to leave it alone <laughs> i i know that uh, tomas was advocating this change he's not um, able to join the meeting so yeah okay then he needs to bring it to the list not to get home <laughs> <laughs> He he actually brought the issue to, to the list um, in early February, um, but um, we further discussed it in the GitHub issue and uh, also personally in a call. So, but I can also bring this issue back to the list and, and see what feedback comes. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that's the right path forward. Okay, thanks. By the way, I'm still in queue for the end. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm still in queue for my original point, but I'll hold till the very end, just don't kick me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so next issue also by by Tomas on section 4.4. So fact, section 4.4 provides some text on root key update and um, it kind of, um, focuses quite a lot on using uh, or implementing root key update delivery via LDAP directories. And um, he says, so this is not how, how things are handled these days um, necessarily anymore. So there are other ways. So there is a opportunity to do it via general messages and uh, the newly offered um, CA key update uh, content message, but you could also do it via um, URIs in the AIA um, extension of the certificate. So therefore he advocated for updating this section. So he already did a first go on on this and after a discussion i did also provide a, a pull request on this the question to the working group is do we want to go into this topic do we want to update this section or should we leave it as is so it makes sense to me to uh, remove the dependencies on ldap but it's important that you preserve the old with new, new with old, because that, yeah, uh, I believe 4210 is the only place that's documented. Right. <laughs> I also checked the, the references and, and there are quite a number of RFCs referring to this description. Um, yeah, but but also this quite, quite big picture, this tabular picture also focuses quite a lot on um, doing it via LDAP and maybe this is not how most of the people do it these days. All right. Uh, John, are you in queue about this topic? Yeah, yes, I was just going, I guess you can't see me. I was just going to agree. Yeah, we definitely need to keep the link certificates language in there. We definitely use it. Um, and yeah, it's very useful. So I don't think we're going to, like, yeah, it has to be backward compatible. And, we, and like you said, I guess if this is the only place it exists anywhere, um, we need to keep it, so. Okay, thank you. Good, so uh, 
as we have a, a pull request available, should I merge it and submit the version or does yes. yeah, people want to look at the pull request first? Uh, the only way you're going to get consensus is to post a draft. Okay. <laughs> Good. Thanks. Um, so this is uh, the point on uh, this, yeah, not incompatibility issue, but uh, the issue on potential incompatibilities between um, using password-based Mac for POP and for message protection in 42.10 and 42.11. Um, if not a Mac is used, if a Mac, a HMAC is used, but a Mac algorithm that uh, um, requires a key of a specific length, a key expansion mechanism may be needed, which is specified in 42.10 and not in 42.11 probably because uh, 4211 says HMAC is a mandatory to implement um, Mac algorithm, but still people could use a different one. So we did some clarify or added some clarifying text um, to 4210 bis. Um, the question discussed among the authors was whether there is some at least erratum needed for 4211 or not. Um, so it is just, if no one requests this erratum, it's fine with us, but we wanted to bring this to the attention of, of the, the group. Anyone uh, worried about the size of the key for uh, CRMF? Not hearing anyone care. <laughs> okay, I will close the issue. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so one uh, change. Now John's jumping sorry. the queue. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I just had a. So when you say close the issue, you mean you're not wanting to put the text in? Because I mean, we did run oh. into this issue. No, we, no, no, we no. did what he put said it. Is you have it in 4210, but he's not going to do anything about 4211. Okay, okay. Yeah, as long as it's clear, it's clarified in 42, or the update we're doing. Okay, that's fine with me. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. wanted to make so, sure I understood. Thanks. So, uh, the clarifying text is in version 8, uh, the current version of uh, 4210 bis, but there is uh, no hint or clarifying erratum in 4211. And, and finally, that was a question to the group whether that is, is needed or requested. Okay, thank Good. you. So, uh, final issue. So, as we introduced um, root CA key update content, which um, made the old with new and new with old link certificates optional in this structure, um, it is different to the previous CA key update content uh, structure where all three certificates, the new with new, new with old, old with new, are all mandatory to provide. Um, we see quite some use cases where we do not need all the link certificates. Therefore, we provided this new structure where we have some optionality. And Thomas requested to also offer this optionality to the um, CA key update announcement message. And therefore, we proposed uh, to add this new um, definition to come with version three. So it should be backward compatible, but it should offer the option to also use um, root C, CA key update content with a optional link certificates. There is also a pull request if, yeah, if this change is uh, additional change is fine with the group, I would merge the pull request. And when you have concerns with this approach. I see no one getting in the line, so go ahead. Okay, thanks. I think this is it. I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's a 
backup slide if someone wants more details on the cam-based message protection. Okay, Mike. Okay, Mike Ellsworth, also sort of speaking on behalf of Sean Turner. Um, <laughs> so, that's unfortunate, yeah. So, we've been asking since 116, maybe even since 115, for review of the chem combiner stuff. I want to ask again, and like at some point, this draft is going to get to the state where it's all done and we're blocked waiting for review, right? The and maybe I'll give a bit of an overview to help spur some people to go look at it, that we're doing two things with chems. One is the straightforward thing of we want to encrypt a cert for itself as the sort of indirect pop thing. That's relatively straightforward use of chem. The other thing which is like weird is where CMP needs to establish a Mac key to, to, to integrity protect messages. Bob has to do a chem for Alice so that Alice can get a Mac key to integrity protect her message to Bob. Mm -hmm. And like that's a weird use of chem that doesn't follow any other patterns in other in other uses of chem that's coming through. So like that's going to need review because it's weird. Um, I don't know how we do that. Like, do we just like point to people like David in the back who I know has the expertise to do this review? And because we how do we how do we get review? You you do what you just said. In addition, <laughs> in addition to calling for that specific hey, I need review of this idea. Please look at this section, right? As opposed to look at all the diffs in this doc. Yeah, so you could hit the, the arrow key on your keyboard on the next backup slide and that, you know. Where yeah, do you want to go? Forward. Forward. That one? Yeah. Like, yeah, Hedrick has had the slides in the slide deck for like, for IETFs now, like these are the mechanisms we need a review on. Okay. Point to the slide in your call. <laughs> Sorry, and I, I, I was remiss and didn't say why I was here on behalf of Sean Turner. I don't know if Sean Turner is gonna say that. Yeah, okay, hi Sean. <laughs> Hey, I'm Sean Turner and I am in the room. Um, I'm gonna have exactly the same problem for the CMC documents that we're starting to work on. So it's not just a one-off, it's gonna get used in multiple places. And okay, it's kind so, of, it's, so it's we're a, seeing a new design structure here. Yeah, it, so this, and I mean, we wanna make sure it's good. It, it's like, remember we had like diff, this diffie helmet pop mechanism, right? We right. basically need that for these. If, if the, these certificates are ever gonna be used where you're trying to get a certificate that is purely uh, you know, a Kyber cert and you don't have a signature, a way to sign it. Now, some people would argue that no one ever is going to do that because most people that use these things get them from enterprises and they make them centrally and then give them out to you. But I think that to fill out the matrix of things you can possibly do, we do need a new way to do this. So thanks. And anybody who's got the expertise, uh, please speak in little words so I can understand. Thanks. <laughs> um, I'm probably wrong and feel free to tell me why because I'd like to understand. But if this is really an important thing that's going to be used in multiple drafts and it needs its own sort of review and things like that, is it sort of asking to be a draft on its own explaining this new idea? So, hey, it's Sean Turner again. Um, I was kind of just going to basically point at what the CMP stuff does. So there's not like an argument, right? Like at the end of the day, they specify it and then I'm going to be like, for this other certificate management protocol, we do exactly the same thing. It's just called different fields. So I guess you could pull it out if you really wanted to, but I'm definitely not trying to slow them down in any way. Um, just because it's two separate protocols, I don't know. I mean, maybe you could put it in one draft and then point to wherever, but I don't know if that's better. We tried that with CRMF and the two continued to evolve in their own way. <laughs> so um, it doesn't always work. Yep. Okay, so please, everyone review the stuff on this slide and send concerns to the, uh, the mail list. Any, there's still two people in the queue. I think they're old, is that correct? Okay. Um, the next document is RFC uh, 7030 CSR attributes. I don't recall slides from Michael. No, I didn't send any. Okay. This is the document that 
done. We think we're done. Does anyone think they're not? Okay. Uh, yeah, I've read it. A bunch of read it. <laughs> uh, um, all right. So, uh, Michael, you. you I don't recall where we were. Did we do a working group last call yet? No. Okay, so that's where we are. So would the minute taker please tell the chairs to make a working group last call? Because <laughs> that's how our memory will make it yes. happen. <laughs> and if, the, if we forget, the authors can poke us, please. Yep. Okay, next up is uh, the lithium certs. Trying to take myself out. Hi, I'm Sean Turner again. Um, I think I can do dilithium certs and kyber certs in one fell swoop. The only updates that were done, their new versions were pumped out. We changed the names from dilithium to ML DSA and from kyber to ML chem to match the NIST stuff, and we're still waiting. Um, I think I put some warnings in the kyber draft. If we put any examples in there that these are like pre finalized versions in case anybody did anything with them, that they would know that whatever they implemented was probably going to be wrong. So um, that's it. So basically, we're still in the process of waiting. And no matter how hard you ask me or how many times, I'm not going to put annoyed in this document. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not going to put a testoid. We're going to wait for the nistoids. Uh, was this practice producer? Yes, 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 they will. <laughs> Hi, uh, Rowan May. Um, so there's this document for an uh, ML DSA uh, in X509. And then there's a document for SLH DSA in CMS, but there isn't one for SLH DSA in. Yes, there in, are. Oh. <laughs> uh, where, They're where? just not all adopted yet. Okay. We, and we'll be getting there, further down. Really? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> what is missing is Falcon, <laughs> right? Um, okay, so Sean, that covered both. And so now we're up to um, CSR attestation. Mike, did you send slides? Did. I sure hope so. Ah, there it is. Attestation evidence. <laughs> That's what I got. Uh, oh yeah, hello. Is there, is there actually a camera? Yeah. Yep. Is it looking right at there. It, no, it's looking at me. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Does this work? No. I don't think so. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So the, yeah, this is the IETF LAMP CSR attestation. So it's the draft. Yeah, next slide, please. This is the whatever kind of attestation evidence you have. Here's how you put it in a CSR internet draft. Um, it is, this is just the sort of refresher of what we're doing, where this draft is not specifying any new attestation formats. Um, this group is, this authors group is doing that. We're doing that in rats. Uh, this document here is just whatever bucket of bits you have, here's how you CSR it. Um, so we're defining a new CSR extension, attribute evidence or extension evidence if you're CRMF. Uh, we carry evidence bundles, which, ca which carries evidence statements and also a bag of certificates. So this, uh, this is just refresher from last time. We have this sort of tiered architecture thing because uh, you may have, a, a, de a device may have more than one signed statement it wants to convey to the CA. You may have third party endorsements from the hardware manufacturer or NIST or somebody. You may want to bundle multiple things. There may or may not be certificate chain overlap. You may or may not want to group things. So we end up with this sort of tiered structure. Um, at the bottom of the whole thing, an evidence statement is an OID. It's a, it's a type. Um, what type? Yeah, it's an OID, OID and, a, and a generic value slot. 
So you can assign yourself an OID and then stick whatever data you have in there. Um, I want to point out this internet draft is not, is explicitly not telling you how to put evidence into, a, into an issued certificate. This is merely for a device to provide evidence to the certificate authority so the certificate authority can decide whether or not to issue that cert. There are totally valid use cases where people might want um, attested evidence type stuff in a certificate. We're not touching it and we're not touching it because there's privacy implications to that. Um, it might be okay for you to tell your CA what patch level your HSM is or the unique serial lumps, unique, unique ID of your whatever, super cookie, whatever, tell your CA, but you might not want that published in the CT log. And there's a whole rat's nest, pun intended, of privacy implications there that I think need to be addressed. We're not addressing them here. Next. Okay, so the only really substanti substantive change, you can see there's a lot of version revs. Uh, in Prague, we were at 02, we're now at 08. We did a lot of version revs. The only, there's only one normative change since then, and that's that the evidence statement has added a hint. And so in, in discussions, we've been having regular design team meetings every, every other Monday, uh, regularly for almost a year now, and it came up that the person who is parsing this evidence, who is deconstructing the CSR, and then has this signed object it needs to you know, rummage around and find a library to parse, may need a hint about which library it's supposed to call. We imagine that each vendor might provide their own parsing library, um, and so you need a hint on the outside of the envelope to, to hint about yeah, which, which library you're supposed to call that will know how to parse this thing. Um, and so we've defined it sort of as a general name, but with the weird legacy stuff ripped out, uh, we expect the most common here is gonna be a URI or a domain name or something that uniquely identifies a piece of code. Rich looks skeptical. <laughs> okay. Um, if that's the way people identify their software, I don't know the URIs uniquely to identify a software library in all cases. Maybe? Rich, go to the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Rich Souls, Akamai. Mike non officiato <laughs> enthusiast. Um, I think there's too many choices and having a nested structure in there. I mean, make it either text, which would be a library name in a version string, or just a URI that points to something that's presumably readable or release notes or something like that. Just pick one of them. Okay, so simplify this further, basically. Yeah, there's enough complexity elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for the suggestion. Complexity. Else. Okay, next, next slide, please. That's got to be a tagline. Put yeah. your complexity elsewhere. <laughs> uh, so we have a bunch of non-normative changes. We've added, we've greatly expanded the explanation and context text. We've added uh, a bunch of samples and appendices that show you how to use this. Uh, within the design team, we've had long discussions on freshness. Uh, how do you? How does the CA know that this evidence was generated, you know, somewhat recently, or was generated in lockstep with the key that it's it's attesting or whatever? Uh, and that's all good. You're like, yes, the consensus is that basically, yes, freshness is good, nonces are good, but not always possible in a CSR context. Um, we know people like to reuse CSRs. We know that CSRs are sometimes generated in an air gap network and then carried out. So the you don't get to assume a full round trip from the CA to the device, the, like the TPM or whatever, doing the attestation and then back to the CA. So it's good where you can do it. You can't always do it. And regardless, that sort of implies a carrier protocol. There's some communication between the CA and the, and the, and the device. And that's like, that's all well outside the scope of the CSR object itself. So uh, Hannes and uh, Hendrik have a, have a draft doing exactly this in CMP. And that's the place where it belongs. It belongs in the protocol. You say, here's how you put an attestation nonce down so that it can be embedded in the, in the CSR. So that's, this is all good, but doesn't belong in this draft. Um, yeah, we've now added a bunch of appendices. So we've got two concrete worked examples. Um, 
at the hackathon this weekend, we did a super good job of coming up with uh, a TPM2 example. So we have actually hackathon code that will actually query your TPM on your operating system and then generate a CSR with it inside. So that's awesome. Um, and Hannes provided a complete PSA token example. The next sort of weird thing that we're doing, and this is this is new, is we're creating two, two new IANA registries in this document. One is the first one, actually, let's go to the next slide. I expand on these. So the first one is the obvious and straightforward one. Um, IETF will undoubtedly need to register OIDs for a bunch of different evidence formats. Um, our RATS document is going to be the first one in line to do this. So we need a, a registry where we can assign OIDs for evidence formats. Um, I think that's pretty straightforward. This draft is calling for it for that registry to be created. The next registry is less straightforward. And this basically is trying to answer the question, if I'm an implementer and I'm trying to implement this draft, I'm trying to implement a parser for this thing, I'm inevitably gonna ask the question, what is the set of OIDs that I'm expecting to come across when parsing these things in the wild? And has anyone written a nice summary table of all the OIDs that I can expect to see? And so the second registry is, and we're curious on community feedback here, if this is, whether this is a thing IANA actually wants to do. Can we ask IANA to, to have a public registry tracking OIDs registered in other SDOs that you can expect to be used here? And so the structure that we proposed is, is this, OID description reference document, which in the example that we're doing here is a TCG document, and the change controller for that OID is TCG. I expect there'll be discussion on this one. Next. I'd like to push back on that idea. I understand why it's helpful to the people here, but how do the other SDOs know they want to tell IANA? They don't. So the way, the way we wrote the text is that um, anyone can submit an OI to be added to this. You just need to reference a document. So that when you, anyone comes across it, they can uh, help others discover the OID to spec linkage. Mm -hmm. Okay. That works for commercially or, or publicly available. I can put the OID and here's a URL for a document that will let me learn how to do it, but not an OID and a, it's private, right? Is, is, Okay, so it'll just be a first come first serve registry. Yeah, um, and please look at the wording. We did define in the IANA considerations where we asked for this registry. We did do outline a, a process for um, um, ask, asking on a mailing list for these for a new entry and then a designated ah, expert review. I see. So it's really I, uh, it's really expert review. It's really expert <laughs> review. Yeah. Okay. So I yeah, please please take a look at the text that we proposed and see if that makes sense as a workflow for this sort of weird type of registry. Um, so yeah, this is a thing we definitely want community feedback on. Michael Richardson, the mic. I think what's weird is we normally ask Iana to give us numbers, give us the next number four three four five six seven eight. In this case, the entities probably already have their their right. OI because they already have arcs. If they don't, they're probably not tall enough to play here anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, and anyway, they can go get a, ask for a pen if they want. That's good enough. The, the, the thing is that normally we do this with, it's not obligatory that you add something here, but what, what Mike is trying to do is make it clear to implementers, here's a bunch of things that you might get. And um, when your customer calls you and says, I've got this thing that showed up and you're like, ooh, we didn't implement that one. Oh, look, it's this new thing. We can actually figure out what does it even mean, right, mm -hmm. from there. Um, and uh, I think that's, a, as you said, it's a useful service. If it didn't happen, the, the, the protocol wouldn't be broken. It just would be harder right. to implement. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not the normal thing that, we're ask, that we normally ask IANA to do, but I don't think it's that weird. I think one of you should swing by the table this week and ask. Sure, that's if a good they, idea. If they would push back if we asked for this. Good good thing to do, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, and you can eat chocolate too. Yeah, <laughs> and take some chocolate while you're there, yes, indeed. Rich. Uh, 
the TLS ALPN and um, now I just lost the other one, but there are registries where people come with predefined names and we just say, oh, is there yeah. documentation for it? And we put it in. So it's not that unusual. Right. That was Rich Sells, Dr. Mike. <laughs> uh, is that the queue? Yeah. Yep. Okay, do I, have, do I have more slides? Yeah, cool. Um, so next steps, I mean, this document is getting really quite mature. Uh, we have, reminder, we have quite some time pressure. This is all work to try and satisfy a cab form requirement that went into force last summer and is really horribly, hideously manual right now, and we need some automation for it. Um, so I think pending the hackathon, which went quite well, and generating this, the, the sample that's currently missing, um, I think this document is really, really close to working group last call. How really, really? Is or is almost? Uh, once that sample is in, I believe it is. So that's going to be put in? <laughs> once I can finish writing those Python scripts. <laughs> <laughs> so next round. Yeah. OK. All right. Any, any further questions for Mike? Okay, thank you. Okay, so that was the last of the PKIX active documents. We're moving to the SMIME related documents. So the first one is 5990BIS. Um, that document's already been through uh, last call. Um, there's, at this point, um, the last rev, I think, resolved the issues. If anybody has any that they feel are unresolved, please scream on the list now. <laughs> the next one is um, LAMPS CMS SHA-3 hash. The working group last call asked that we have uh, support for uh, KMAC as a KDF. NIST assigned two OIDs so for that, and they're in the document now. It was posted right before the cutoff, <laughs> literally right before the cutoff. Um, and I uh, posted that that was the only open issue, and once NIST had the OIDs that are posted, so I believe this one is ready for the IESG. If anybody thinks otherwise, please scream on the list. Okay, um, who's gonna talk to CMS Kyber? That's me. Okay. All right, good. Did you send slides? Yes, I did. <coughs> there we go. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So uh, I did a fairly um, big rewrite of the draft, uh, restructured it based on RFC 5990-BIS, um, and also aligned it with the CMS Chemry, <clears throat> um, updated Kyber to ML Chem instead, uh, took the KMAC that Russ just mentioned from the other draft, um, reason being because ML Chem uses SHA-3 and Shake under the covers, um, updated security considerations, and we have two implementations with hackathon artifacts. Uh, so if anyone has any more, please let us know at the hackathon, um, or the hackathon email addresses or the, or the GitHub. Uh, next page, please. <clears throat> um, so yeah, for the changes for the mandatory to in implement components, we put in KMAC um, based on comments last uh, last time in Prague, we put a S256 as M2I for the 192-bit security level uh, because AS192 is not widely as widely deployed. 
Uh, we put in the must support for KMAC uh, without a customization label because the shared secret is not reused in this context. Um, there was a question, and I think this is going to come up in Mike's uh, presentation later as well. What about implementations that don't support Kachak at the CMS level? And then the alternate question is, what about implementations that only want to support Kachak at, at all? Um, is there a concern there that we're, we're requiring the use of KMAC uh, where Kachak is not available at, the, at a higher level? So we'd like feedback on that. Um, Next page. Um, does anyone in the room want to address that point? Uh, that uh, should they be supporting a, an approach that allows Shaw 2 as the KDF? Please, please explain why if you have that requirement. Hey, Daryl Piper, uh, because Deb said so last time in talk. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's all. OK. And then I guess the question is, if we want this, how how does this get in there? Like, if you put two mandatory implement to implement algorithms there, that doesn't really help Deb's question because it's still mandatory to implement a SHA three based one. Do we put no one mandatory to implement ones and just say do whatever you want? <laughs> um, so yeah, like more information on how to proceed with that. Uh, if that's how we want to go. Um, next page. Well, yeah. So the oh. the in one case many years ago we did one where you must support this or that. Okay. But that doesn't. When it gets to the ISD, you better be prepared to explain why are you doing this because at least it, in that case it happened. Uh, you're you're creating non interoperability. Uh, situations with two classes right you're either going to be able to communicate to one of them and not the other okay uh john might have a comment I mean, I think this to, to qualify i think you know deb's point yeah. is one has fielded experience and one is theoretically better right and i, I vote for fielded experience myself voting yeah yeah, so my comment, John Gray from Entrust, I think it's similar as the person that was just there. So SHA-2 is more widely deployed. Obviously, it's been out much longer. People have that implementation. Um, SHA-3 isn't as much deployed, so I think it should be there, whether it's an OR or something. Um, I guess that's up for debate, but I think it should be. If, if we had a choice between two SHA-2 and SHA-3, I think... I mean, we had, actually, was it in this group? We discussed, I don't know, one of the groups anyway, crypto that's, you know, widely deployed, well used. Let's make use of that. Um, is there a reason not to use SHA-2? I don't think so. So I guess that goes back to Deb's comment from the last IETF as well. Yeah, and so. I'm not Deb, so I can't speak for her, but I'm not, I'm not opposed to an OR myself in this particular case. But again, you're going to have to justify it. Scott passed. Yeah. I'd like to point out that if you don't trust a uh, Scott Fleur Cisco systems, I'd like to point out if you don't trust SHA 3, I believe ML, the security of ML Kyber, uh, ML Chem goes away. So you, if, you, uh, if you do trust it, you, and as long as the state is good, which should be easy to check, uh, SHA 3 should be safe. Yeah, so I thought that. I thought that Deb's point last time was more that um, SHA-3 or SHAKE might not actually be available at the level that CMS processing is happening, and not that it's not trusted. Um, yeah. So anyways, I, go ahead, John. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, yeah, the crypto layer level, right? Like, you might have access to you know your algorithm that contains SHA-3 internally but maybe you don't have access to the algorithm by itself but you have access to SHA-2 so I guess that's that's the issue you're talking about right so yeah I mean, that's I think having the choice is good okay I can add an order with justification and then let people fight about it if they want um <clears throat> 
Okay, um, continuing on. Uh, there was, um, oh, does Mike have a question? Yeah, Mike Ellsworth. Pause you for a second, just to highlight the, you also, we also changed, um, yeah, changed to, to KMAC, right? And is there, I yeah. Think, ask for a review on that and whether there's substantial differences between like HMAC SHA 3 or just Bayer SHA 3 or KMAC, whether those are relevant here or relevant for security reasons. Yeah, that's a good question. If, if anyone has any opinions on whether the difference is relevant, then say so. Um, right, so uh, for this section here, basically, uh, this draft is very heavily based on uh, RFC 5990 biz. Thank you very much, Russ. It made my job easier. Um, <clears throat> during the review, as pointed out uh, twice independently, that section 1.4 of this draft and by extension, section 1.3 of 5990 biz, which is the, um, what's the title, the, the processing summary, was possibly a little confusing <clears throat> because it basically restates what's happening in the CMS chem redraft, except with less detail. Um, and so I guess I'd question to the rest of the group is, is this confusion confusing? Should it be removed? If it should be removed, should it also be removed in 5990? Um, is uh, next question? Oh. That's a good question to the whole group. Um, but have, if RFC fifty nine ninety bis having just completed working group last call, if if yeah. uh, if this should be removed, someone should have screened before now. But yeah, please, Fair please look at this. <laughs> yeah, and and make sure that we're doing the right thing. Okay. Uh, and next, I think there's one more slide, or maybe two. Um, yeah, so what's what we're waiting on is obviously the ML chem voids for NIST. Uh, we're gonna make some encoding examples once we have the final draft as well. Uh, as mentioned, may or may not remove 1.4, but if nobody screamed about it for 5990 biz, and maybe not. Um, <clears throat> Harmonize security considerations with Kyber certificates. Um, I don't think that draft has any security considerations, so feel free to steal ours and we'll reference yours. I think yours should be a higher level one than ours, so we'll reference yours. Uh, have to add an ASN1 module with s caps and chem algorithm definition, although I think that one also should be defined in Kyber certificates. If you guys wouldn't mind, if you do mind, then I'll do it. Um, I think Sean next page is just a thing. Hi, this is Sean Turner, uh, author of the other draft. Um, let's coordinate so that we can do this smartly so that we don't step on each other. And yeah, you're right. The security considerations, I think, are like, say something about side channel attacks, which we threw in like a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we right. need to put a little more thought in uh, what actually needs to go in there. Okay. Uh, I believe that's it. We have one more slide that says thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. <laughs> and thanks for your comments on the other documents during their last call. No problem. Okay, the uh, next one is CMS using Sphinx Plus. There's been no changes since the last time when we just went through and changed Sphinx Plus to um, <laughs> the dash DSA um, name. Next is composite chems. Mike? <laughs> Good, fun one. All right, next, please. Okay, let's start with the elephant in the room, <laughs> which is a carryover from CFRG from an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The elephants in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So I obviously wrote these slides uh, more than an hour ago before the, the CFRG session. But so just, I figured I'd give a quick summary. For those who have not been following the CFRG action here, um, on January 31st, the CFRG chair started a call for adoption for the entire research area of hybrid chem combiners. Uh, the call for adoption was left open for five weeks. The, th the thread received a whopping 150 responses, uh, many of which were themselves not short. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone read every word, you're a hero. Um, so the consensus here was yes, the topic is adopted, and CFRG just an hour ago announced that yeah, the topic, the whole research area will be adopted. Uh, the CFRG chairs will form a design team. The exact goals of this effort are still very nebulous. How many chems are we defining? What combinations are needed? Uh, it's a lot of clarity is still up in the air. But what is clear is that this document here at LAMPS is a subset of that work. So um, yeah, in true ITF fashion, we don't know what we're building, but we're definitely building it. Okay, next. <laughs> Clicked it. Yeah. And I clicked it, and it says reestablishing connection. <laughs> Great. <laughs> that is why. Welcome to so here. Long. No Ethernet cables, right? <laughs> um, okay. So, with the elephant in the room addressed, um, let's we'll talk about the editorial changes we've made recently. So, changes in version 03. Um, we have removed everything that's not ML chem. Based. So now, since all the combinations that we're doing here are ML chem based, we've changed the title of the document to be Composite ML chem for use in Internet PKI and CMS. And we'll get to the and CMS. That's also new. Uh, we've added a few more co authors who are, have been actively participating in this work for years. It makes sense to list them. Uh, we have added text to the introduction to justify where and why this mechanism would be useful, uh, sort of citing regulatory, um, regulatory encouragement. Um, we've added a section use in CMS. So we know that it's convention in LAMPS to define the algorithms in one document and then define the use in CMS in a separate document. So this text was written so that it could be standalone and moved out to a separate document if we want to, but for now we tucked it inside here. Um, so this is defining how to use it with us, uh, ChemRI, to do CMS encryption. Um, and then similarly to Daniel's talk from a minute ago, Dan, uh, we switched the, all the KDFs uh, for both for both the chem combiner itself and for the use with with ChemRI to use either KMAC 128 or KMAC 256. Uh, yeah, aligns with Dan's talk. Next, please. Still to do, we need samples. Uh, the hackathon is actually coming along quite nicely at producing samples. So at some point, I might just snipe snipe some certs out of the hackathon repo and stick them in here. Um, and of course, we're waiting for the outcome. So this document is probably going to get blocked, waiting for the outcome of the CFRG effort. Uh, and we also, of course, need to synchronize with other working groups that are doing identical things. Um, CHEMS and HPKE, Jose, Jose, OpenPGP. Um, and these are a little bit different than hybrid CHEMS, for example, in TLS, because the protocols I've highlighted here expect long-lived non-ephemeral CHEM keys, which maybe have some implications on how they're used in the protocols. Uh, and then I have some open discussion points. So yeah, this is the elephant in the room is how do we align this draft? Do we wait? Do we go forward? Do we, yeah, um, do we expect that this draft just sort of hurry up, hurries up and waits to for CFRG to finish their effort and then we take their recommendations and adjust this draft to align? Or do we, so is this sort of a, get it ready and park it or do we want to do we want to be doing active cryptographic work here is sort of point number one do you want to wait till the end or do you want to discuss each of them as, as we get to them however okay discussion point one anyone want to respond to that i'm currently waiting for uh i think rick, rick yeah. is out okay um, so I, in name, regards to your, name? you know, hurry up, Rohan sorry, Rohan. Rohan May, uh, in regards <laughs> to your, uh, hurry up and wait question. I mean, I think that, uh, lighting a little bit of a fire under CFRG isn't necessarily a bad thing. Hmm. 
the real Rich Sauls is now standing up. Um, yeah, don't wait, because I think also this might have the, I think it's a benefit of having other working groups say, oh, wait a minute, there's one already here from the quote unquote PKI experts. So, uh, <laughs> you know, eh. but um, having a specific combiner and showing two use cases of it um, that might also help people say, oh, well, maybe we should just pick one and adapt it for our use case. So, yeah, don't wait. I can say that not being one of the people who's going to be writing it, but yeah. Anyone want to offer the other side of that one? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll offer the other side, which is we're seeing active academic work showing that the naive combiners don't have the security properties you want. So I don't know that we want to get ahead of the academic security analysis, which is not happening here. Well, remember how this worked out in TLS. The, uh, they put forward something, and then the academic folks went and studied it and told them how to improve it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't put them a straw man, they don't study it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next then. Uh, yeah, this this is Daniel raised the same. So everything Dan said, uh, plus here we have the extra complication that we are not just taking a shared secret and deriving a key from it. We're in fact taking two shared secrets and deriving a key from it. And that does change the security analysis. So where ChemRI can sort of freely swap between KMAC and HKDF SHA-2, it's less clear that you can do that safely here because HKDF SHA-2 is not known to be a dual PRF. So there's, there's a whole additional layer of questions here about whether SHA-2 provides the same security properties as KMAC. So this is, like, I recognize the desire to have HMAC SHA-2 based combinations, but again, security analysis is needed to say whether that is a, an allowed equivalent substitution or not. Go ahead, Gwen. Um, Queen Dang at NIST. Um, I think our group, this group here is not tasked with the uh, crypto analysis and uh, crypto review. And so those two issues uh, we happen right now, um, they, they, I definitely recommend to be, uh, to be worked uh, at the uh, CFRG because we, we're not tasked with the, the job to, to do crypto analysis here. And those two issues need, um, you know, formal verification, read through uh, proof papers and look at all angles to see any flaw in there or, 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 or we have covered all the angles, things like that. So it, it, takes, it takes time and, and, and a lot of expertise and we here not tasked to do that. So I recommend to let their separate chain urge them to, uh, to help. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, discussion point number three relates to the, uh, the user key material. So that, Russ, I, I guess this was on list, right? I published your yep. comments. So do any of our composite chems require a UKM? And you said, I can imagine a way to, to use DH and ECDH that require a UKM. And I think this discussion is, again, broader than LAMPS, is um, this sort of relates to the discussions of do we need to bind public keys and in what context do we need to bind public keys? Because that is, I think, the obvious thing that would go in a UKM, right? Is that what you're mm -hmm. referring to there? The receiver public key? Well, our RFC twenty three sixty one or twenty six thirty one one of those <laughs> um, had a way that you had to use the UKM, which was the way to use Diffie Hellman uh, with uh, CMS, which was a way to use, uh, which specifies the way to use uh, Diffie Hellman with CMS. And uh, it was based on the X9.42 spec, and it needed the UKM. And so if you are doing Diffie-Hellman that way, you need the UKM. 
<laughs> and that's that's distinct from doing that binding at this chem RI layer, right? Correct. <laughs> No one's running to the mic on this one. Probably because there's three people in the room. All right, <laughs> next. <laughs> so yeah, the, the grand summary here is this document is stable. Uh, for, I mean, stable, but not finished. We're expecting, um, we're, we're, yeah, we're heavily pending the outcome of CFRG, which may, you know, uh, trash the entire design here and force us to rewrite it. I don't know, but for now it's stable. Um, and that we're, we're continuing on with, hack, with the hackathon. You know, people are implementing this draft. The Open Quantum Safe is implementing this draft. Uh, they've got artifacts up recently that's going to be in an upcoming version of OQS. So there's implementations growing. I don't know what we do. I mean, this procedurally, this feels like a bit of a hurry up and wait kind of document. So I don't know how we go forward with it, but for now, it's fairly stable. Okay, any further questions? So we're now down to uh, less than five minutes left. Um, I don't think we can get through the next document in that time. So I think that this is a place to, to call it and we'll resume uh, this section of, of documents at the next uh, session, which is later in the week. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Can I have the final word? Mm -hmm. uh, so, because, so I may not be at the next kind of lamp meeting due to other conflicts. So uh, I am your outgoing kind of sec AD and the good news is you are gonna be in excellent hands. Uh, Deb Cooley is going to be Michael. the AD taking wow. over. Uh, she knows a lot more about this than me. So again, <laughs> great, uh, in, in great hands. Uh, administratively though, uh, I'm gonna do something that uh, typically doesn't happen because I am not rolling off the ISG. I'm only rolling off being kind of sec AD. I do still have a number of LAMPS documents kind of with me. I have talked to kind of Deb and the working plan is everything that I already have that's past PubRec is gonna stay with me. So all of those things that are in ITF last call, I'm still gonna push them through the ITF, to, through oh, the, sorry, the ISG. Thank you, sir. And so kind of the benefit <laughs> yeah. of that is we're not gonna lose any time in the, in the AD kind of transition. Yeah. So things will kind of continue okay. with their velocity. And congratulations on your selection as IETF chair. <laughs> All right, then we're done for today.